and welcome to Speech Communication 4397, Effective Meeting Management. Uh, we have a special guest with us today as advertised on your syllabus. And for you channel surfers, you're in for an additional treat. Uh, with me today is William E. Watson, I call him Bill, uh, Jr., William E. Watson, Jr., who is a lawyer and uh, more importantly to us, he is the mayor of West University. And he's going to be sharing thoughts with us today, talking with us about uh, his duties as mayor, how the council works, or at least some of the things about the council works, whether we find out all, I don't know at all. Uh, but we've been, we've been talking about large meeting planning in here, and now we're shifting the focus of the course to executive boards, executive committees, smaller groups. And so this is a relatively small uh, council, I understand, but it has a considerable amount of power. So, tell us, what, what does your city council do, and as mayor, what do you do? Well, the council is made up of a mayor and four council persons. We have two lady council members and two male council members, so we're pretty well divided and uh, uh, in compliance with all the existing laws. And we have about, um, meet twice a month. And it's the, the most important thing about it is we are a home rule city. Now, that may not make a lot of sense to you, but there are two ways you can become a city in the state of Texas. One is a general law city, which is usually cities of under 5,000. And you're regulated by the local government code and the general laws of the state of Texas, and you can only do what the law allows. A home rule city, starting about 1912, has full legislative powers. We can do anything that the law says we, except what the law says we can't do. So that's the distinction between the two. If you got over 5,000 people in the city, it's probably a home rule city. And uh, that uh, allows us to do just about anything except what uh, the legislature specifically said you can't do. So we're, we, we do whatever we need okay, to do. And, and those laws are laid down by the state of Texas? State of Texas. Uh, are they inherent in articles of incorporation or is just something you know about the way cities work? Just something you know about the way cities work. There, we special. talked about we ahead. talked about bylaws and how bylaws give you certain powers, but this doesn't have anything to do with bylaws. These are state laws that tell state you laws. how to become a city. Okay. Right. There was a time when we had the special law cities. Those are the old old cities, like say Gonzales or Nacogdoches or something. Charge special charters from the governing body. That's no longer possible. Either right now, you're either a general law city or a home rule city. Most are home rule that have a qualified population. And the government, the state doesn't really inquire into the population count. You go out and you say, we've got 5,000 people, and you've counted a few dogs and cats and so forth. The state doesn't care, really. They're not going to come in and start checking on you. Or they come in and say, oh, you only have 4,990, so you can't. They don't do that. If you're anywhere close to 5,000, you can be a home. Now, the, um, the uh, council has um, pretty big authority in so far as the city is concerned, but there are certain rules which we have to follow, especially having to do with meetings, which is what I understand this, this class is primarily about. And I suppose the, you stop me, Martha, I'm okay. just, Dr. Horn, if I get too, going too far. The important thing about a meeting is to have an agenda. If you don't remember anything else, from this class, remember, have an agenda. That's good. You can say that again. Okay. <laughs> We're right. talking about agendas. Because the person that walks in with an agenda is going to run the meeting, control the meeting. So I, recently I was in a legal conference of some sort. I, my client is falling out with his other pe people, you know, and they finally they got their lawyers involved, so you know how serious it has become. But we took an agenda in to just a conference between lawyers and clients and so forth. It controls the meeting. So always, always have an agenda when you go into a meeting. Um, it, it causes people to stop and think, why are we here? What results do we want to accomplish? And how are we going to accomplish them? Otherwise, you might flounder around and you go off on the paths and so forth. But as long as somebody has taken the forethought to think down through the process, and I'm talking about any kind of meeting. Like I say, this was just a meeting with lawyers, you see. Any kind of a meeting. Uh, we were, not long ago, meeting with a person on an estate planning. My wife and I, I practiced law with my wife. And she had an agenda. 
He brought it in, and we, that's, so that's what we talked about. So I am a firm believer in agendas. And so that is the one thing if I would like for you to remember about that. Now, in our city, the city manager prepares the agenda. He knows what bills and ordinances are need to be enacted and that sort of a thing. But he calls me first, and he said, let's go over the agenda. So we talk about the agenda for a while. Now, any two city council members can put, also put something on the agenda. If they need, uh, they have a special project or they have something that they think needs to be brought to the attention of the whole council or something, they call up the city manager. But he had not put it on there until he calls me. We have a good working relationship. So uh, we, we decide what's to be on the agenda. And then if the last minute somebody really wants something, you know, well, we will put it on there also. Our citizen, citizen might call in. Say, you know, I'd like to y'all to consider thus and so. Because if it's not on the agenda, we can't, we're not even supposed to talk about it. So new business is not an option under the no. sense that some no. groups. No, no okay. new That's business. an interesting departure. Yeah. Um, second, so I continue? Mm -hmm. Second thing <laughs> is that if you are going to be in the meeting, it's not quite as important. But if you're going to be any, have anything to do with chairing the meeting or so forth, know how the vote's going to go before the meeting even starts. <laughs> Don't have surprises. The second thing, remember, if you will, two things. One, have an agenda. The second is avoid surprises. Of course, with five people, that's easier than if you've got 200. Right. Okay. If it's a big, <laughs> large town meeting or... Um, that sort of thing, or city public meeting of some sort, it doesn't really matter because you're not going to vote on anything. You're just going to come and listen to how people are for or against or complain or so forth about the, uh, the meeting. So it's not important in a large meeting. It's the important meetings where you're going to vote, where the council or the governing body is going to vote on something. Know how it's going to go before the meeting starts. You think, might think, well, that kind of takes the spontaneity out of it. That's exactly right. If you want spontaneity, plan for it. If that sounds a little contradictory, it is. But don't, don't do it any other way if you can keep from it. In other words, if we, uh, the city manager and I decide that something, you know, spontaneous might occur, we plan for it. We tell Dustin, so you do the one so, and you do, and, and everybody else thinks it just happened, you know. But um, that, that's not deviousness. I don't think it is. Uh, it just keeps you from doing things that are illegal, considering things that shouldn't be considered, considering the meeting from getting out of control and not accomplishing the ends that you want it to accomplish. Plan. Avoid surprises. Now, um, if the importance, if the results are important to you, know what they're going to be. Call people up before the meeting. What do you think you should do about, we should do about this? Yes, sir. You want to know if you, if you knew the results and they weren't favorable to you, would you have the option or the election of postponing your meeting until you could sway those nomads that don't want to vote along the lines, or can you lock them out or do something cute along those lines? As long as the agenda item. We can take yes, we can do that. Has been known to happen. Uh, uh, it disappears. It suddenly, it's not on the agenda. Ah, oh, we forgot or something or. Previous administration. Right. Yeah, previous. <laughs> or the city, we blame on each other. The mayor pulled it, he'll say. The city manager pulled it. You know, we, we know. But uh, normally, we don't do that very often. If it's on the agenda, if it ever gets on the agenda, we go through it. But if it does look like the vote after you're in the meeting is going to go the wrong way, see if you can get it tabled. So, yeah, pull it. Pull it there. That, that is. And that happens every now and then. Somebody, you can always get somebody to say, somebody to say oh, I need a little more time to think about this or a little more information or something like that. And um, usually the rest of the council, unless that's a chronic complaint of this person, will go along. They'll say, okay, we'll table it and give you two or three more weeks to think about it or something like that. It can get you in trouble. I had a, a, a personal references permissible in uh, It's going over 33 <laughs> counties. If All they right. won't sue you, go for All it. Right. You can defend yourself. So. We were... Um, <laughs> We were having a tree meeting on our tree ordinance. Now, West University Place has a serious tree ordinance. You can take a tree down, but unless it's what we call a class four tree, which is an old china berry, hag berry, or tallow tree, you've got to, the city forester, we have an urban forester, 
who goes out and measures the tree inches of the tree. And you're required to replace that many tree inches on your property or on somebody else's property close by or on the city's property. But you can't get away without doing Or you can pay money. It's about $150 a tree inch that you, you can pay for that sort of thing. Well, it was coming up for vote. All the, if you're there, they know we call them this. The tree people were there, you know, <laughs> and their supporters. And the tree people are a serious bunch of people. I mean, a tree is a serious matter then. So they were all there, and they thought it was going to be passed. Well, one of the council members, who doesn't normally do this, but who is an engineer and a meticulous sort of guy, you know, and which is good. It's good to have a balance of that sort of thing said, I have some problems with this ordinance, and I think thus and so should be done and so forth, and I want two more weeks to think, to see about this. Well, I like the guy, you know, and, and I wanted to get along, so I got one more person. I knew one more was slightly leaning in that direction. So it was a 3-2 vote. The tree people were terribly disgusted. They had been there to see this pass. They were having a planning, a kind of a little celebration uh, somewhere, uh, you know, to uh, celebrate the new tree ordinance, and we disappointed them. And it was bad. I, I vowed, if at all possible, not to let that happen again, <laughs> because they, um, and they, they were, it was, I understand, you know, they, they had worked hard, on, but two weeks later, we passed it. This guy got him satisfied, the question, but none of them were there then, you know, and so uh, it didn't work too well. But, um, Normally, you don't want to, to be surprised about something. Shh, phone around. You know, tell, the telephone's for, e easy, you know. As long as you don't have three council persons in the same room at the same time talking about the same thing, it's, it's, it's all right. Um, so call around and kind of find out. Or just have the city manager or somebody do it. You don't have to do it. Yes, sir? When you say no more than three talking about the same thing, is that in compliance with the Texas Open Records and Open Meetings Act? Is that your yes. concern? Yeah. You and here. it's not an agenda item, and it hadn't been notice posted. There's all thing, kind of things wrong with council members, three council members, on our, our majority. On ours, it's three. That, That's uh, because three is a majority, three is a majority. and a quorum is a majority. Right. We talked you can about come quorum. back and scream you had a secret meeting in violation See, oh. of the Open Meetings Act. But the three is significant because the three is the majority yeah. of five. And I, uh, that's, uh, glad you brought up the Open Meetings Act. I was going to talk about it, but we'll... That is a serious thing. They people now, whereas before they used to just fine you. Now they prosecute. Yeah, that's right. You can, it's $500 fine and six months in jail is a max on it. And um, we're very, very conscious of the open meeting. If, if somebody just happens to go out and grab the door, you know, because of, we rush over and open that door quick because we don't want to have be accused of, and, and we don't want to do it anyway. There's nothing secret going on, you know, that uh, we're not really. Now, there's several reason, reasons you can have a, a Closed meeting. Hmm? Session? Yeah. Um, when you're going to buy land, you don't want to telegraph that to everybody in the country. When you're on personnel matters, uh, you're planning a gift to somebody, a surprise party. Even the law recognizes even that, you see. Um, and certain um, reports can be brought in if they affect personnel. You can have a, a closed meeting. But you have to do it very in conformity with statute. What happens is you have an open meeting first. You start your general meeting. Then you read the little thing that the city attorney has prepared. It says, pursuant to section 526L of the Texas uh, election code or whatever code it may be that you're going to talk about under, then uh, we're having a, declaring a closed meeting at 7.15 p.m. certain date. And then we everybody leaves, close the door, except the people we want in there, which is the city secretary who has to run that, that tape runs. Even the, those closed meetings, there's a tape made. Okay, so your minutes come from a transcribed audio tape? We never or transcribe the closed meeting tape. They're available. Okay, the tape is running for the closed session. Here. Right. Well, it's running during the other session, too. It's just that she knows when to, to stop transcribing. Right. All our meetings are workshops or any meeting we attend, there's a tape room. Yeah. Yeah. It's just we don't transcribe the closed meeting tapes. And after we get through, say, for maybe 15, 20 minutes or something, um, then I know, make another announcement that the closed meeting the hell doesn't so is, is, is re terminating at 7.40 p.m., certain date. We go over and open the doors, 
anybody still left around the bit. We do that last usually because it's you know it's, people don't have to hang around for it. No chairs outside either, right? So if they got to hang around, they got to stand up. Well, they they went around into some other room, they might be able to find a chair, but uh, we don't encourage them to hang around because there's no real reason for them to. Are that. you all under Robert's rules? Yes, we are. Oh, I, have, brought your I have. I have. I was. This is the property, the City of West University place, and um, I'll have to admit I haven't read the whole thing. Y'all may have to read this your class. I'm yeah, not they sure. have to. They all <laughs> own a copy. <laughs> but I have a special mark here. I notice I've still got on motions. I think the Robert's Rules of Order on motions, or, and, and, or motions in general, are one of the complicated things that you, I've ever run across. Uh, well, but, we get through in here this semester, they're going to be so clear. Good for y'all. <laughs> You'll be way ahead of 99 You'll know a whole <laughs> bunch of good parliamentarians when you get through. Good. Because they, the motions are very important. You know, if they're not presented right and done right, and you've got to table them, and you've got to amend them, and you've got to do this and that, they're, they're serious. Motions are serious stuff. They, they need to be, be, be looked at. Um, well, we would, another thing I would advocate, too, is in addition to finding out how the meeting's going to go before you have the meeting, have a meeting before the meeting. Uh, we call it a workshop session. And when you get in the workshop session, it's still got that tape recorder going, but find out for sure how everybody feels about things. The first th and our uh, workshop has an agenda, too. And the first thing on the workshop agenda is review the agenda for the regular meeting, which is the open public meeting. They're all open, but this is a regular meeting. It's required by statute. So um, uh, we go through the agenda of the regular session in the workshop session. I go down one at a time. Here is thus and so's ordinance, uh, thus and so are limiting the number of um, dogs in West University or that sort of a thing. How do y'all feel? Cats that? should put a limit on. I wasn't <laughs> going to mention cats in West University. I can't move in. I have too many cats. <laughs> Six cats or three dogs. That's our limit. Yes. Sir. I have to ask this question. I don't want to get. I don't want to go too far afield because she'll let me have it later on. How did you pass? Did anyone challenge that on constitutional grounds? What six cats? And the three six dogs? cats. No. no one challenged it. No. You know, if someone does, I know it probably will. But. Um, we figure, you know, uh, the health, you know, because um, uh, uh, cats run about, you know. And if they, the person who has too many cats keeps them all in the house, and we don't, well, we don't go around counting cats. We do not have a cat counter in West Shiver, and I'm sure not going to do it. So if they keep them in, or let them out two at a time. One person who had a number of cats said, I promise not to let out more than three at any one time. But the neighbor, he had a neighbor who does not like cats getting in his flower bed. He said, aha, I've watched those cats. <laughs> There's more than three cats out at certain times. And so it, it, um, we had to go back to the homeowner and make him promise, you know, on an oath or something that he would, or board out a couple of them or something like that. In any event, uh, we go down the agenda items. And I, but I, and I also find this. I say, now this ordinance says thus and so. Uh, how do y'all think about it? And everybody says, it sounds pretty good to me. So then I say, you make the motion to pass it. Ha designate somebody in the open, so that in the open meeting you don't say, uh, I will, the chair will entertain a motion for the passage of ordinance number 9556, and everybody sits there looking at each other, you know. I, I hate, that's another surprise. I don't like surprise, no surprise. Plan your meeting. So I say, you, and I write his name in the margin of my, uh, regular session agenda who's going to make the motion then I ask who's going to second it I have a second it. so that way you know as you go through these things that it's going to somebody is going to make the motion or not make the motion and I say if anybody and say two or three people or well, not two or three one person says they don't like the art okay you're going to talk about it if they want to say something in the regular session you know they're all you know got made looking down the way they got a constituents they've got to keep happy and that sort so if they're uh, going to say something, I want to know if they're going to do it before they say it. Uh, once again, you think, well, you don't, I, I don't really like to live on the edge of surprise, or you might have noticed, on the, or anything like that. So I want to know who's going to say what about what ordinance before it ever gets out to the public. Um, that may sound a little bit like over planning, but um, 
we have we don't have a lot of trouble in West University about our meetings and so forth. So I think it's a good idea myself. Now, um, <clears throat> already know really who's for it against it. I just want to know if they're going to make a big deal out of it. You see, <laughs> out in public. <laughs> so uh, normally there isn't. If there is a problem though, if it looks like somebody is really serious. <laughs> You know, or maybe two of them really, or if it's even worse, if three of them are really serious, we table the motion. Uh, we go back and we talk about it a little more, and we get a little more information, and we see about that. I also ask this, who from the city staff is going to talk about the motion? Uh, say we have an ordinance to um, uh, buy park benches. Well, the Parks and Recreation, head of the Parks and Recreation Department is going to stand up out in the public out there and say, what it is and why we need them, and you know, give a little uh, preliminary discussion about it. Then, of course, you you after that's over with, you ask that the motion be made to pass it, and seconded. Then you ask for even further discussion. Nobody has it. Then you take a vote. But I like to get the staff involved in these things. Uh, don't ask the city manager. He already knows, and every, he, sometimes it's uh, hard for him not to join in, and we don't mind if he does. But when we ask something about the public works, for instance, a pipeline or this or that or the other, dull stuff mainly, um, we want the man who wants to make the contract to tell us why he wants it, what he's going to do about it. Even minutes of the last meeting, I ask if uh, anybody's going to ask for any corrections in the minutes. You know, we have to do that. And usually we have a young uh, council member who is very meticulous in reading and catches all the typographical errors and so forth, and she usually has something or other. But I want to know that too. I don't want any surprises about the, even the minutes in the last meeting. Yes, sir. Say the system that you're using then streamlines and allows you to get more done in your actual meeting by taking care of all this stuff that has to be procedurally correct, public recordly correct, but doing it behind the scenes, such as there's going to be objections to the minutes or corrections, let's get those out so when we announce them in public, it's done. This way you wipe your slate clean and you've got time to really get down to government. True? Yeah, I think so. Well, on things that are really important, we take the time to go over it, but we know we're informed about it. You know, nothing is a surprise to anybody. Uh, people who are surprised make bad decisions because you, your emotions you know, kick in and you, you make decisions that, and, or you say things that you wish you hadn't said, you know, that sort of thing. But if, <laughs> but if you, you already know what's going to happen and when it's going to happen and who's going to do what, you don't, have that, you don't have as much of that kind of a problem. Now, yours is the only group that I know of that's this, but knowing you, I'm not surprised, that <laughs> is this meticulous on the front end before the meeting. But what, he, but what he's describing is what sometimes happens within executive committees and executive boards before they go to something like a legislative assembly or the organization as, as a whole. The officers may sit down in a pre-convention meeting and say, okay, here are the agenda items that are coming up before the 400 mm -hmm. delegates out here. Here's how we think it's going to go. Here's what we anticipate. Here is the position of the officers on this. Let's find out where the officers stand and, and then someone is in a position to say uh, on this particular motion the executive committee supports it or doesn't support it mm -hmm. and that will help the member, well it could influence, sometimes it backfires, <laughs> but uh, anyway it's a factor then in the assembly as a whole making a decision. But certainly the people in charge need to know what's happening as best they can. Follow up Michael? What's the average time of your council meeting? I'm Give you a hypothetical. You have two new ordinances that you're going to want to try and pass. You've done all the background. You know who's voting yay. You know you've got this one. It's a slam dunk. So we'll get that out of the way. Got all your minutes corrected from your last meeting. You've got very little opposition. Um, got new business, if any at all comes up. Your new business is disguised as your agenda for this particular meeting. What is the average time you're taking with these meetings in light of what you said you do behind the scenes? The behind the scenes is a whole lot more time consuming. Oh, no. yeah. Average meeting open to the public. If I yeah. was to walk into your city council and come to watch efficient government at work, how much of my time would I be taking? The passing of the ordinances and the motions and so forth would take about less than 30 minutes. The whole city council convened yourself there and pass everything, get all your business taken care of and bang the gavel, 
in an hour? Yes. Now, the time-consuming portion of it may be is the time you let the public speak. You see, uh, we're up the debate. Oh, well, no, not on the particular. Well, here's what we do it. Let me tell you. Uh, say it's a typical regular meeting. First, we open with a prayer. That's probably of dubious con constitutionality right there. <laughs> <laughs> but they I keep re-electing you. But so. we keep doing it anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> but then, because if there's a controversial thing there, you know, we want to pray that everybody will be nice and be sweet to each other and, you know, and for wisdom and understanding and that sort of thing. That kind of calms people. Then we have the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, patriotism, you know, with the flag, we wave the flag a little bit, calm, yeah, calm <laughs> that calms people down again. Then, though, the next thing on the agenda is anybody in the audience who wants to speak about a non-agenda item, and you never know, that's what I cannot plan. That's where okay, the surprise is. time limits on these? Three things. minutes. West U, I mean, you're not going to say I want to talk about the war in Bosnia at a West University City right. Council meeting. There is some guidelines by which people who address the City Council of West U will deal with the West U problem, correct? Well, they nor yes, they always have, but there's no limit anyway. I mean, there's no uh, restriction on that. They can talk about the war in Bosnia. If, if they, they thought West U should send aid to Bosnia. Yeah, or make a right. pass a resolution condemning the Croats or somebody, you know. And But no, one day we did have a lady came in we were, we were debating trees again <laughs> this lady came this was a this was not necessarily a tree lady so that's why she caught me by surprise and I didn't notice what she was carrying she was sitting down and she all of a sudden she walked we were ditching around her trees and her lot very nice lot with some nice pretty trees she walked up and she slammed down a big tree root right on the council table Dirt it all. flew, you know, <laughs> and it made a big bangy noise, you know. And she said, that's what your ditching machines are doing to my trees. Well, that got out our attention. I'll tell you, we paid close. We've talked about oral presentations <laughs> and attention-getting <laughs> devices. This is good that one. will do it. Uh, it was, and you know what? After the meeting, two council members and myself went out to her house to look at that ditch. I mean, she got our attention fast. But you never know. Now, you, what you can do, you know, after a while, I've been in the city as long as I have. I've lived in West Union nearly 35 years. So you, how long have you been mayor? Only two years. Only two. I'm in my second term. We have term limitations. Two terms and you're out. Term limitations is the ballot box. I don't see why people say that they need term limitations. <laughs> if you want to term, terminate somebody's limit, go to the ballot box. That's the way to do it. I agree. But we wouldn't dare do it while we're in office. We might pass it to be effective. <laughs> Ten years down the road. <laughs> but after a while, you can spot the trouble. There are some ladies, you know, if I see certain ladies whose names I will certainly not disclose. <laughs> and men. And men, and it's mainly women, you know. <laughs> and right. men, in that I know they're going to have something to say, and they do. And it's all right, you know. I mean, uh, we need people whose job, who feel it's their job. And one lady's told me this. I feel it is my job to oppose y'all in most things. Well, okay. Keeps on, it keeps on, keeps on track, you see. So, um, uh, that, but that's where you get your, and I, but we do put a three minute limit. City manager sits there with his watch and he um, gives them three minutes. We had one young man, he was a Vietnam veteran, who did not like what we were doing over close to his house. We were putting a you'll pardon the expression, a sewer lift station over close to his house. The very name of it indicates why he did not want it there. And um, he wrote us a long letter, four, about four pages of legal size, single spaced letter. And we got it, and we got it in our packets that the city sends out to us prior to meetings, and we read it all, or we read at it. But then he came and he wanted to read it to us. So we said, okay, three minutes. So ever regular session for about three months he would come and read us a part of his letter then he'd mark the spot as far as he got in his three minutes came back next time read us three more minutes worth oh my. until he had read the whole thing yes sir. time to build a sewer before he got done we built it yes <laughs> there wasn't anywhere else to go. a sewer lift station is like oh, a lot of things you know not in my backyard you know but um Everybody has to voice his opinion. Uh, the project, it, it, it become moot. 
finish reading because the point is moot. We built it. Just about. We didn't, we didn't quite finish it, but we had, uh, the plans had been drawn and the ditching had commenced before he got through. And it, we, we're going to decorate, we're going to put red tip patinias, you know, that's the, that's the, the disguise for all city or, uh, departments, red tipped patinias. You plant enough of them. <laughs> I tell you what you do, you go down the street and you see a, a, some red tip petunias, watch, there's something going on behind them. You know, see. Everybody know what those are? Those it's hedges those. that grow red and then turn green. They're, they're, the, they're what we use. Certain things like olfatory, yeah. things that could get caught in the wind and bring disrepute upon what is behind these pink, whatever they are. Yeah. The more of them you see, the more you better look. <laughs> see what they are. We also put them around parking lots here, though. Oh, yeah. so. <laughs> they're, they're good for, they grow like mad, you know, and then they're, they never die. So they're really good for, like, for that sort of a thing. One thing about having an agenda, too, is you can't get off of it. City attorney, we start strength. We always have a city attorney at our, president at our meetings. He, uh, he's not employed by the city. He's uh, a contract man, and um, he's always there. And if he sees us straying too far off the side, you can't do that. You can't stray too far off your, your agenda. Uh, so that's, that's one of the dangers about it. Well, no, that's a comforting thing about an agenda as far as I'm concerned. I know we're not going to go off into some kind of weird something or other uh, off our agenda. But he's there, and if he sees us straying too far, he'll tell us that um, uh, he'll kind of, Mayor, uh, maybe you better get back to uh, whatever we're supposed to be doing here tonight. And we do that, so we, we, we try to avoid that. Well, let's see, I ask you, too, if you ever needed a sergeant at arms, and your response was? We have the chief of police there <laughs> in uniform with his gun, you know. We've ne he's ne <laughs> so he doesn't have any disruptive meetings. Well, he's always there. And uh, well, he has a very large sergeant. That If he can't be there, the large sergeant is there. But we've never really had any problem with it. The, another thing to remember, too, if you're chairing a meeting, have a gavel. I've had to use Coke cans or whatever, you know, but you need a gavel. And most Americans, if they hear a gavel banging, will stop. It's just, I guess we watch so much TV, you know, where the judges or somebody. But you need a gavel. And I've really never had any trouble. Uh, nobody's ever gotten into a fight at one of our meetings or thrown anything or they've said some... Um, perhaps unmannerly and harsh things, but um, the police chief is, is there, and they know that he, he will be fair, so we do have a sergeant at arms. <laughs> so that might be difficult in some kind of, you know, local association meeting of some sort, unless you have a big, large brother-in-law or something. There was one group that I worked with as, as a professional presiding officer, you know, they're paying me to referee the meeting, but not a little cozy group like this and pounding the gavel didn't work, you know. They, they just kept shouting at each other and so forth. And so I finally shouted into the microphone and said, <laughs> you are paying me whether I preside or not. <laughs> you know, it's your money. And so that got their attention. I said, you know, you can come to order and conduct business, et cetera. But hmm. I can imagine what they were doing with their regular president who was not being paid to be there. So. I think some some groups get in a habit. Of that sort of thing. Uh, we're a rather sedate group, and uh, we just never have gotten into the habit of uh, doing that sort of thing. So even where trees are involved. I was going to ask you on your uh, limit of debate, is that in bylaws? Is it a kind of standing rule set up by the council that you could change? to a five-minute rule if you wanted to, or where does that rule it's, sit? It's in, it's in our ordinance. That, yeah, we have a, uh, in our ordinance it's three minutes, uh, but if we can, you know, we don't, under normal circumstances, we don't really cut, cut people off if they've really got something, to, especially some nice lady, you see, who's up there, grandmotherly type. We're not going to tell her to shut up and sit down. Or anything like that. Like any other organization, you keep it in case you really need to enforce it. If you don't need to enforce it, it's the who's to complain rule. No yeah. one's going to complain, and it's a pleasant flowing, and nobody complains, and the person can ramble on forever. Right. And you're not going to run into a free speech problem because it's time and place and manner. Yeah. You gave me your three minutes. It's a public forum. It's a state-operated forum. Mm -hmm. Time, place, and manner. Yeah. 
And do you have bylaws also, or are the ordinance, ordinances the equivalent of bylaws? How many governing documents do you have? We have two, primarily, and I happen to have them with me. One is the charter, right? It's only about an 18-page 18 uh, 18 document. It, it's kind of the bare bones type of, of the city of West University place. Made by a lawyer then? No, no, it was made a long time ago by people who incorporated the city. <laughs> and it, uh, like I say, it's, it's right here in the, only the, uh, but it does have something to do with the meetings of one kind and another. And powers of the council, the meetings, we will hold two regular sessions each month about our regular sessions, our special sessions. Uh, I can call a special session, or two council members can. If uh, right now we're in uh, considering budget, and we, we need to get up, get through with it, you know, go through it, so we're having a special uh, meeting tomorrow, tomorrow night, uh, on, our, on a budget, budget. And the rules of procedure are the, um, those adopted by the council, and we have adopted uh, Robert's Rules of Order. Then we have the regular code of ordinances, which is all of this part of it. And that's, that's what governs. We, and the, Robert's Rules of Order sets the structure for it. The ordinances then tell us, uh, flesh out the charter. And that, those are our two governing documents. We're in the process of um, putting all, uh, redoing all of our code. Uh, it was scattered all over the place, and we're trying to codify it in one spot where we can just look at one place and find uh, what we need to find about any particular subject. Is uh, all of your voting done by majority? If you Do you ever go back and change something? And if you had to rescind anything? Roberts would say two-thirds. But We've never had to do that. Um, that would be a surprise. Oh, <laughs> well, I should have I don't that. like those kind of things. <laughs> Um, if you plan ahead, you don't really have to redo what you've done. And we've never had to rescind it. We've tabled, mo like I said, we've tabled things, and we've gone back and amended motions, you know, or, or uh, ordinances, but only after um, some kind of a discrepancy was found or we found that it was Okay, now really if you're amending an ordinance, is that previous notice on a majority vote? Previous notice on two-thirds? Previous majority. I mean, a previous uh, notice, but just a majority. Man, majority. You have to give notice just like it was a regular order. Excuse me, I, I didn't understand what you were saying. 72 hours, you know, before you, the agenda has to be posted. I believe it's 72 hours prior to any meeting. Unless there's an emergency in which it can be reduced to two hours. If the hurricane was hitting or a, a terrible epidemic struck or something, we can have a shorter time. But normally it's posted on the door of the... City Hall. Do you have a definition for emergency? or Not really. We've not defined it. We are going to go with it. Yes, sir? Both of you, I think, Dr. Hahn, I think I see the connection you're trying to make. In other words, if you effectively plan your meeting and follow the book, and follow the rules, you won't have the courts micromanaging your cities or your city councils, but you step away from those rules or the ordinances or the 66 uh, 66701, which is the Open Meetings Act, you're going to have courts micromanaging everything you do. So I guess that's the point you're trying to drive home? Well, then, and, and we know from briefly talking last time about voting, uh, I was just working with the convention that uh, had a 7 8 vote to adopt some, they had unanimous agreements, then they had 7 8 votes to, uh, to amend the unanimous agreements, they had 3 fourths vote proposed instead of the five-sixths that it took to amend the bylaws. And then there were things, you know, amendments that went by majority. But this was a group of 26 national organizations that needed to cooperate with each other. And so they were really sticky about those voting procedures. And so that's why I just wondered here if, if different things, you know, if every, with five people it kind of makes sense that a majority mm -hmm. is going to take care of that. But part of what these people have to think about is when they expand to other contexts and they have an executive committee of 13 people or 21 or whatever, um, you know, where a good place to draw those lines might be. And so I was curious if everything is done by majority and if there are amendments to things that have been previously adopted, if that's still previous notice 
and a majority. If there's anything that's an exception to the majority vote. Not no, we don't. Not not yet. Uh, if it, it's come up, uh, and I, or the, or I didn't uh, know that it was supposed to be done, the city manager didn't catch it, or it hadn't come up. So we, it's normally just a majority, and I, and I believe uh, in our, our system of meetings. But somebody out there that does math in their head faster than I, what is two thirds of five? Is that four or three? Yeah, you know, because Robert would, does say, well, then you round upward. Three. I think it's three. Oh, two, so th it's two thirds is still three, and yeah. a majority is three. So we're covered, I guess. Yeah. So, <laughs> but, but you know, like to to go back and correct minutes is equivalent to, in our jargon, amending something previously adopted. And Robert says it takes a two thirds vote to amend something previously adopted. When One you say vote. minutes, I mean normally that, according to Roberts now, mm -hmm. I have done some peripheral reading of this. You cannot do that until you get the majority to approve the minutes. If there's any corrections to be made, once they go in and they are approved, one of the deals you told us was protect the rights of the absent. Say somebody didn't say something or didn't introduce a piece mm -hmm. of legislation. He'll come running through, read the minutes. Then you have to go back and reopen it by majority right. rule. But before they're ever adopted, there's plenty of time to clean it up. So right, but what, no, but what I was asking here is these minutes are approved, whether it's the West U City Council or if we were doing minutes of class and we got the guest's name wrong or whatever. Whatever, we've approved the minutes by majority vote. And then a meeting later, we go, oops, there was a mistake. The person's name is wrong or the amount was typed in, whatever it is. There's an error. And it takes a two-thirds vote to uh, amend or correct something previously adopted. But if you only have five people, three is it either yeah. way, so you're okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> which may be why you haven't, the organization that hasn't made be. the distinction of two-thirds. Has it always been a five-person council? Mm -hmm. As far as I can, long as it's, we've had a council, it's been five people. The mayor votes the equivalent to every councilman. Do you vote equivalent to every councilman? Yes. Who breaks the tie? You can't well, there's have five. a tie with five. Including yourself when you say five? Right, okay. right, right. Four council person and myself. Okay, but what happens, and we'll see if the class has done their homework, what happens if out of those five, one person abstains and they split two to two? Abstention counts as a yes. Yeah, wrong answer. Abstention counts as a yes. Only if the bylaws say so. Some of the bylaws did. They normally don't. What our, happens in your council? Our council, uh, our, they're our, not allowed to do that because you, you, you got to work out in the workshop. <laughs> you cannot abstain. <laughs> Are you serious? Like I'm you serious. Abstain? You cannot abstain in West University City Council voting. You got to vote. How can you make somebody vote? Well, what will you do to them if they don't vote? I'll call that the you have police a chief up there. And say, <laughs> <laughs> you will <laughs> vote now. <laughs> no, well, we. I've had a lady. Uh, one council person tried to, to abstain one time. I said, Gardner says you cannot abstain. You've got to vote yes or no. And so she did. And uh, that's the only time it's ever been a problem. Well, this is a new note for me. This is the only group I ever knew that had well, what that. What happens with the abstention, Dr. Hahn? The suspense is killing me. Anybody want to venture a guess? No, not ready yet. The motion, fail. the motion fails for lack of a majority. Okay, because every other organization that we've had this with, our bylaws have said an abstention is a yes. That's to keep everybody who doesn't want to publicly vote or, or become embroiled in a controversy keeps them honest. No, they say that's, that's not under Robert, and it would need to be written in the bylaws. But, whether, but it's important to realize that when you're not in these situations where everyone does have to vote, that if the vote is one to nothing, that's a majority, and the motion carries. If the vote is three to two and 12 people abstain, that's a majority, and the motion carries. But you would put in the minutes that 12 people abstain, you know, so that you would understand that there was a quorum in the room and that you have all these people who are either confused or apathetic or, or you know, for whatever reason, they're choosing not to vote. But if it's a tie vote and the chair or president, presiding officer, has already voted, then the motion fails because the chair votes in order to do what? Two things. 
to break the tie. Tie is the first one. Break the tie and or create a tie. Last question for. Oh, it won't be the last. Mr. Watson. <laughs> so we start out like saying that, but you know it won't be. You said earlier your your city attorney was a independent contractor. He's not your full time city attorney. Mm -hmm. Good. Now, assume with me, how do you get the fiduciary and the attorney-client privilege if he's not really your attorney? Like, if he gave you bad advice, I could see why he doesn't want you to come after him if he causes you to be sued. But I could take his deposition because he isn't really your attorney, is he? He's an independent contractor. No, no, no. I, I'm an attorney. When I have a client come in, I am not in, uh, I'm a, there's an attorney-client relationship, although I'm not employed on a full-time basis by that client. But it's the same principle. In other words, uh, he, he, is, he, he works for us by the hour, which is where any lawyer works for any client, by the hour. In the like, minutes. You know, huh? In the minutes. In the minutes. <laughs> yes. Um, and he submits. Up to the nearest 15. <laughs> Was it law students in here or something? Is that? Just Michael. Oh, okay. Well, yes. Uh, Got I, some speech majors, meeting management types. <laughs> so there, um, he, he, we have a client attorney client relationship with him, but uh, he's not. He submits us a bill once a month, a detailed, itemized bill, you know, so many hours spent on dust and so, and with a sum total, and uh, we send him a check. Let's yeah. see. Well, we're on voting. Yeah, everything show of hands? Do you do secret ballots? When do you have a written ballot? We just have an oral ballot. I uh, Just all those in favor, say aye type situation. Oh, see, I already know how it's going to go anyway. All those in favor <laughs> say aye, you know, and the, those opposed. Do they so, ever request, though, a written ballot? Are they allowed to be anonymous on their positions ever? There is a provision for it, um, and why, it seems like one time, and I can't remember what the occasion was, it, it, uh, that was requested, and we did. We had a, a ballot, and then it was presented to the city secretary. He counted them. And it escapes me at the moment what the question was. I don't know Probably how I let cast. that get on the agenda. But it, anyway, it was there. So, uh, yeah, we do have the request sequels. of one person. At the request of one person. We do. we do voice votes, I guess, since there is no formal count. If you're the chair, you go, the ayes have it, that's it. That's all she wrote. Yes, that's right. Although, if, if I don't hear somebody, you know, I'll ask. You know, I said, did, did, you, did you vote? I don't want any of these abstentions out here, you know. So they, they say their vote. So if I can't hear them or something, I, I ask. Of course, the city secretary is there. She's got her tape running, too. She so. recognizes the voices on the tape. It's on the tape, yeah. There's only five people you can Top see. Of predicate. I recognize it. Well, um, now, you're not always, though, going to be in an organized meeting. I have I've had some experience, if you'll let me, with the just informal, um, I mean, yeah, loose. You can transfer to some other groups we know. Okay. <laughs> well, i tell you where it comes up. Where We're it on two other committees together. <laughs> um, it's small country churches. There's this building there. They own property. I used to be in, do some oil and gas work. And geologists have a tendency to find an oil field where there's several country churches with graveyards. That you, if you find a place that's got a thick bunch of country churches with graveyards, there's got to be oil there. <laughs> real, real. And it's Wright County as well. And, yes. <laughs> so the question is how to, get, how to get some action out of this totally informal, loosely organized group, you see, when they own property. Um, the law recognizes the situation, and of course the oil and gas industry is not going to be frustrated in the state of Texas simply because we can't find out who owns it. So what we do, you know, you post a notice that a certain day, if they're there, if they meet once a month, uh, every other Sunday, something like that. Then you post a notice and you make an announcement before the whole group. Now, on a certain date, we're going to have a uh, hearing, a little gathering, a meet, congregational meeting to do thus and so, whatever the purpose of the meeting is. And when the people show up, if you are done what you should, you have somebody already prepared to nominate a chairman. <laughs> and then you have somebody prepared to nominate a secretary so that there will be a recording made of the, the event. So what you do, you, you convene the meeting. Anybody can do that. Then you say, do I hear any uh, nominations for a permanent chairman of this meeting? Somebody, if they're listening, if you have to jostle them a little bit, get up and say, I nominate Joe Smith, you see. So Joe Smith comes forward and 
he knows he's going to be nominated. And then he asked if there could be anybody that would be act as permanent nomination for permanent secretary. And one comes up. So then you uh, present the proposal to the group, and they have to uh, one approve what they're going to do, and then two nominate some like, trustees or something to actually execute the documents. You never can forget that. It does no good if this group says they. Otherwise, you got to go out and get the signature of everybody there, and those who weren't there, and those who were whatever. So then you uh, use those people, trustees, and, and you can do your business. Yes, sir. The document. Then you record, record the, docu the document. The yes. The clerk's office or you're out of business. All right. Then you, you take it down and record it, and you pay the church, a little church, a bonus and so forth, and they put on a new roof and paint the building, and everybody's happy. And, um, but you, you will run across those kind of, and, of course, the associations. The, the, the Texas law recognizes really two large groups. Corporations and unincorporated associations. Corporations we don't have to worry about. They're governed by the Texas Corporation Code and case law defining that. The bylaws of the group and co t t um, case law, which is described and, uh, and defined those. So we don't worry about corporations. Their, their meetings are going to be conducted in the standard, uninspiring way. But it's the unincorporated groups that, where you can have the fun and surprises if you don't plan plan ahead uh, its own constitution and bylaws if it has any governs in other words if you've got a little organization of some sort get you some bylaws you need bylaws because and if they're not immoral or illegal they will govern the structure of the meetings and the, how the organization conducts its business uh, and you'll be surprised sometimes I talk about these little country churches they've got them Sometimes back there somewhere, you know, and some old lawyer or grocer or the man that owned the, the country store or something got together and drew them up some pretty nice bylaws. If you can find those, that's all you need. Just go right by them. So bylaws are very, very important in that type of a situation. And the, the courts will recognize if, you, if the bylaws say, you know, limit membership in some peculiar way that doesn't violate um, uh, some state law or federal law, <coughs> That controls the discipline of members. You miss three <coughs> meetings, you're out. You go. The, so the, the, if you, by assuming membership, you subject yourself to whatever the bylaws of the organization are, no matter how strange they are, if they're not immorally illegal. It's so, a contract between you a, and the yeah, organization. Yeah, it's, you assume the obligations under the contract whenever you become a member. So those kind of organizations are around. You know, they're just a little local sports group or civic group or anything like that sometimes is uh, need but but it's more and more because of, of these types of litigations <coughs> the litigations that are ending up in the courts are church groups these people are, are going to court wanting to remove their head deacon or whatever this gentleman may be mm -hmm. um, and what the courts are calling into question now is let's take a look at your bylaws let's take a look at your right and the court says these are your bylaws i mean they're lousy i agree as a judge i think they're lousy but y'all agree to them bye that's right they're very important. And since you all know all about them now, you know, and you... Well, you they're just getting started. Oh, Last I see. class, we went over the I basic how important they were. content, you know, yeah. name, object, purpose, members, meetings, that sort of thing. It, it's a very important thing. D any really peculiar bylaws you recall? I mean, I told them about one group I was aware of that I'd worked with, that the board elects itself and the membership just comes to the annual meeting to see what the board's been doing. But it's a self, but that's what the bylaws say. You can and have a self-perpetuating group. You sure can. Yeah. And um, I didn't know if you'd seen any that were I can't, I can't remember that any at this particular time. They, um, they, a lot of times in the, the deed to the un, uh, unincorporated association, it would say if it ever ceases to be used as a church, graveyard, school, then it reverts back to the family, you know, that made the grant in the first place. So you've got to be careful that you don't, when you take an oil and gas lease or you do something else like that, you don't subvert the original purpose or it reverts back to people who may have not been around for a hundred years. And, well, that's a problem. Hmm? On your hand. Battle of heirs and that sort of a thing, yeah. So that's that's the most, uh, I know I'm my, I, great 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 grandfather started a little town south of my hometown called Leesville, Texas. I hope they're not listening. 
But he put in the city charter that if anybody ever bought a piece of land from there and sold liquor or even drank alcohol on the property, it reverted back to him. Well, it was not constitutional, and it hasn't happened. But he was a, he was a minister, of, and he did not like alcohol. So you can find some rather strange things if you go back into some of these city documents. But normally, uh, they're, they're, they're sane and sensible and just for the conducting of business. Also, well, let me, one thing about a home, another thing about a home room. What time do we see? Oh, we've got 20 minutes. Oh, okay. So. You know, you have a, in home rule cities, you can have a strong mayor type of government or a city manager type of government. How many of y'all have talked about that or not. Uh, Houston has a strong mayor type of government. Bob Lanier can hire and fire department heads and do has all manner of, of uh, powers, whereas City of West Universities has a city manager type government. In other words, I'm something of a, for many purposes, just a figurehead. I've often thought that a trained monkey could do about 80 percent, if you know he could train him to smile and be nice, you know. Not uh, lose his temper. Not lose his temper. And don't be surprised. But um, the city manager really, and he has the power to hire and fire department heads. And he can do just, he, his, it's his job to run the city from on a day-to-day -day basis. Now you think, well, what, who's, well, we can hire and fire him. You see, that's the catch. The city, I believe even the state law provides that no matter what the structure is, that the City council has the right to hire and fire the city manager. Otherwise, you get a complete dictatorship, I guess. Yes, sir? Oh, okay. But um, uh, normally what you do when you have a strong mayor type of government, you pay the mayor. It's a full-time job. You pay him a lot of money, and he devotes full time to it. The city manager type of government, you pay the city manager, and the mayor then is kind of a, a volunteer type situation. I do not get paid a substantial sum of money, and practically nothing at all, in fact. So, but the city manager is, is he's good, and, he, and he's a good one. We have a good city manager, and that's a real crucial thing to select this proper city manager because he's going to control. So how Galveston uh, has it set up the same way. They have a, a mayor that you very rarely hear of. It's like Queen Elizabeth. They really don't have any power, and yet you have a guy named Matthews that controls the city in right. emergency crises, spending, budgetary operations, police mm -hmm. department interaction with the federal courts, uh, it all goes to Doug Matthews. I mean, Ms. Right. Cruz does hardly anything at all. You never even hear of her. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a it completely distinct difference between the two. Uh, they're, um, they're poles apart insofar as the power of the mayor is concerned. The set, other than um, hiring and firing the city manager and setting the agenda and presiding over the meetings and that so forth, uh, the mayor doesn't do much in the city manager type of government. <clears throat> Let me see here. Now the um, um, once again, I had I think we pretty well covered the Open Meetings Act, but um, you have to once again give 72 hours notice of a closed when you're going to have a closed meeting, and you must be very careful to observe the the physical aspects of it. In other words, have the door opened. In other words, I don't care if it's cold wind or occasionally some person will bring um, a baby to one of the council meetings who will get upset after a while and start screaming and crying and they'll go outside. Well, we don't have a very big city hall and it's difficult to carry on business with a baby uh, screaming at the top of his voice, but we can't shut that door. We, if anybody goes and shuts the door, the police chief goes over and opens the door back up. So the Open Meeting Act is, 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 is like we've said before, is not something to, to fool around with. It's, it's very important that, um, that you abide by it. Now, we also have the city attorney present there to give um, opinions on, on whatever comes up. In other words, we're meeting under a certain section to, for, uh, that has to do with personnel or anything like that. We may have the personnel department man in there, and the other, I'm talking about the closed session, excuse me, and the city manager in there to give us his opinions as to what um, should be done under this or any other particular circumstance. 
What about uh, indemnification? How liable are you as council members for consequences of actions? And maybe you can transfer that to unincorporated groups mm -hmm. as well. Just how vulnerable? Have quasi judicial immunity for their decision making powers up until that point, so long as what they do does not violate the U.S. Constitution. A home rule city can just, you know, its only limitation is what the legislature says or the state or federal it can't do. So unless it does something really outrageous, there's not much of a possibility. Of, I mean, like uh, the lady with the tree root, if her trees all started dying, would she just sue the city? <laughs> <laughs> you know, if they really had killed some fine vegetation. Well, it, it, as a matter of fact, we had a somewhat similar situation not, not very long ago. There was a, a block that had a lovely oak tree in one of the lots. Well, the, the older couple sold that lot house was torn down and the purchasers wanted to buy, wanted to uh, put a big house on it. That oak tree was right in the way. And I'll have to admit it really was. Well, the adjoining neighbors did not want that oak tree cut down and went down and asked, asked for a temporary injunction <laughs> at the courthouse for that. A lot so, of tree inches to replace it. A lot of tree. Well, they just didn't want it cut down. And yeah. it, as a matter of fact, although it certainly will never be named, uh, the man doing all of this was an instructor in the University of Houston Law School. <laughs> no, 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 we won't, we won't go into that. So um, what we did, um, we had to go down and, and have a meeting, uh, have a hearing on about the temporary injunction and got it lifted, of course, because he didn't own the property. He just liked to look at that tree over there that was <laughs> blocking the way and so forth. Yes, sir? question for you, as an attorney, where's the irreparable harm? I mean, where's the balancing equities if you tear down a tree? Why would the court want to grant a temporary injunction? What he got was a TRO in essence, yes. ex parte, he, right. and y'all went down there and got it dissolved when he tried to convert it to an injunction. Right. When he tried to get a permanent injunction out of it, we got it dissolved. Well, I, as you probably know, uh, I've gotten t TROs before. If you can, you know, if you can smooth talk the judge pretty You can get good. a bond, you can get a TRO. You can get a TRO. You can get a TRO. Ten days. It's good for ten days, okay. normally. Well, that one I got one for only 10 days. They, they, 14 is a max, I think. They can give them less. And this judge um, uh, let me have this. But in this instance, I think it was a 14-day one. We had plenty to cause it was the city. We had to gear up, pay the city attorney to go down and fight that. And uh, he did. And we, like I say, it was lifted. But um, as far as liability goes, now, of course, most corporations have insurance policies. You have a, City of West University place, we do not, we're pretty well self-insured. The Texas Municipal League, we're members of the Texas Municipal League, and they have an insurance program, and as members of the league, we become available, some of that becomes available to us. But on our individual actions, uh, now for instance, it's simply the master-servant doctrine. As long as we stay within our prescribed area, uh, we, we can't really, now, if one of the council members jumps off the, went down and poked somebody, then you've got a, uh, he's without, without the scope of his. Uh, it's an individual tort. That's his problem. It's not <laughs> the city's problem. problem. <laughs> not ours. So we don't have much problem with liability. Every now and then, though, a disgruntled employee will sue the city for a wrongful termination. And uh, we had one of those that went all the way to the Supreme Court of the state of Texas one time. And um, so that you can't, but it was just. It wasn't a, um, a personal liability for the council members. It was just that the city was being sued for wrongful termination. And, uh, okay. What about other groups like church groups or uh, voluntary associations? Can you comment on that, how liable officers are? I mean, well, you, you, know can, everyone... you can be liable for that. That, that. There's a dangerous ground there, but it's hard to get good insurance. Yes, sir. What you were saying the liability any, anybody. So anybody for anything. It's yeah. the cost of the litigation that's scary. It's not the ultimate judgment that will scare anybody away from public service. It's just the outrageous cost of having to defend against it. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, well, as members of the Texas Municipal League, they will come in and assist us where the city is being sued. And they hire, in effect, a local attorney to represent us in addition to the city attorney. And the city attorney works with him and they um, try the lawsuit or do whatever is necessary to, to satisfy that situation. 
but individually, um, it, it's very rare for a city council member or anything like that to get, be sued. And I, I guess I'm, I'm thinking of groups like Greek organizations that have chapters and national yeah. officers, and if there's a hazing incident, mm -hmm. uh, then national officers may be liable for what people at a local level are doing. There's liability for that type of con uh, tort unless it's shown that the members of the organization the structure knew of it, approved it, and condoned it. Once they can show that, they can go all the way up the ladder. But simply because an individual chapter chose to do something that was on its face illegal, you can't hold the, the organization responsible. There's no immunity for a crime, in other words. That's the short end of the tort. You commit a wrongful act, you can't claim any kind of immunities because you committed a wrongful act. The master-servant doctrine does not apply to a situation like that. What does it take to be incorporated? In As a Texas? city? Well, or an organization, if, if we were forming a partnership. Oh, you could, well, one person can I mean, we, that's a term we've thrown around in here, yeah. articles of incorporation. Yeah. Uh, it takes very little, in fact. You just file an application with the uh, Secretary, uh, Secretary of State. State and uh, you can even now, the Texas law has been amended so that the same person can be president, vice president, secretary, everything. You oh, know. really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Take I the, thought uh, you had to have at least three or five directors. Used to, but not anymore. No. You can... Um, Is that unique for Texas, or do you know? I don't know. I don't know. Delaware has a lot, and they want to take away some of the fees from Delaware. Delaware was always a haven for incorporating. That's why I incorporated. It was Delaware. It was the only state that allowed that to happen. 34 other states now. To let one person hold all the offices, is that what you're I saying? I hold the office of president, vice president, treasurer, and secretary in my corporation. I am the only person I have to answer to. But that could only be done up until a year and a half ago in Delaware. It was the only place that they would allow it. And incorporating in Delaware has wonderful benefits. If you have something to incorporate, yes. I was going to ask you, what, what were the benefits of, I mean, say you're going to, into business, what would the benefits of being incorporated be as far as um, financial liability or something like that? Well, limited liability is the, the classic reason for doing it. In other words, if you put the money you put into the corporation and then the corporation is held liable in some way or other for damages or something, only the money that went into the corp, they can't get to you personally. Unless you have uh, penetrated, they're able to penetrate the corporate veil. In other words, you haven't kept your records up. Uh, I assume you have your meetings and Absolutely. There is no error whatsoever, neither the possibility thereof. <laughs> if you if you incorporate it, then you just put take the carpet money and put it in your pocket or your bank account. You don't hold meetings, and you're, you even though you hold all the public offices, you still have to hold a meeting and elect yourself. And, and keep you, minutes. And keep minutes. You could. I wonder why people think something's wrong with you. They go, he's walking around talking to himself. <laughs> well, I'm talking to the vice president. <laughs> you're having a meeting, yes. But um, a lot of people incorporate when really, this is a little bit off the subject. That's okay. I mean, unless, did you have anything else here you really wanted to no, cover? No, not, okay. not really. We've got about five minutes, so we'll. Um, a lot as of long as you want to give them free legal advice. <laughs> sure, I don't mind. <laughs> uh, incorporate when what they really need is some good insurance. If you can get a good insurance policy that will cover the same situation, you needn't to incorporate. Because you do have to um, have all this structure, you know, corporate structure. And a lot of people are just not geared up to do that sort of a thing. They, they don't, they're not disciplined enough to keep their own private corporation uh, in conformity with state law. And all they really need is some good insurance. If, that, if all you're looking for is limited liability, insurance will probably cover it. Yeah. Other Any? thoughts or questions? Oh, you're never quiet, Michael. <laughs> okay, uh, I guess the um, I've, I had to kind of sum up about meetings. You know, you, I can repeat kind of what I wanted. Be sure and have the agenda. Be sure you know why you're having a meeting. Uh, you want to know you want to do something, and you want to do something about it. You see, that's really what an agenda is and, and all that. So um, if you can do that, I noticed that uh, at some of the committee meetings that the legislature holds and, and stuff like that. 
if somebody, even just a member of the group, will come in and he's the only one there with an agenda, that people follow that agenda. It's just that, that important. And then, um, of course, the second thing, as I mentioned, is um, check, be sure you know what's going to happen before the meeting convenes. That's not too difficult to do. Even if you're not the chairman or the presiding officer and so forth, uh, PTA organization, anything like that, the, any of the members should, if they've got a, an, something that they want done, they've got to plan it. You've got to, you've got to plan how I'm going to get this done, uh, who's going to introduce the motion and so forth, how many votes can I get, and that sort of thing. So uh, always don't, don't just go into a meeting, you know, just like, a, you, know, like you were born yesterday. Meetings are important. If it's important enough for you to be there, you ought to know why you're going there and what purpose you want. Now, if you're just, you know, some of the local civic group uh, wants to have a meeting, you know, and plan a uh, lighting the streets or something like that, well, of course, there's no, no real problem there. In fact, you probably do not want to get involved. If they're that, because that means work, you see. But um, uh, what you do in the case like that is you be sure you've got a, a somebody else who will work and you nominate them, you see. But you should always always plan good or well before you go into a meeting. Are you as mayor ex officio on anything else? Are there other groups around the community that you are expected or invited to participate in? Is there a, an area, a regional mayor's organization? Or? Yes, there is a Harris County Mayors and um, Managers. Association meets once a month at some very nice dining place, and uh, we kind of uh, 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 Mr. Mayor Lanier never goes shows up. <laughs> <laughs> it's all of the smaller mayors around that uh, attend these types of things. But that's about the only thing. Now we do have a lot of organizations. I'm a firm believer in getting things done by committees and special groups rather than hire hire people to do it. Uh, it's my theory, at least in West University Place, there's somebody, maybe two or three there, who can do anything. And they'll do it free if we find them and put them to the task. And then after they're through, we pass a resolution. I didn't think of talk about resolutions. Resolutions are in part of it. It costs you nothing except the paper that they're printed on. And you, and you, you recognize these people for the splendid job they've done. You present it to them at a regular council meeting, you know. They like it, you know, it's a nice farm. And remember that, recognition of achievement is a very important part of any kind of a meeting. And if they um, uh, don't, then you simply drop them out of the committee and you don't say anything. You know, we, we, we do not have a public, public um, dismemberment of any committees, you see. We just allow them to. Now, to do, do you as mayor appoint the committees, or does, do you recommend and the council approves the committees, or how do you get a committee? Well, we primarily, we all do it, we do it together. We have a workshop session, and we say we're going to have, once a year, we've just gotten through this process. We appointed about 120 some odd people to various committees in West University Place. And, um, some people, we, we get resumes. We send out the resumes for them to fill out. Fine, it's a blank, I mean a paper with blanks. And um, we normally get more than we can use, but we put them somewhere. We never have anybody that wants to be on a committee in West University that okay. doesn't get on. Okay, but it's the council as a, council whole, as a whole that's approving right. that. Right. Can you as mayor <laughs> set up special committees? Or if you thought one was needed, you'd make it an agenda item Yes. You'd work it out. We, we did. Um, I'll give you an example of it. Be okay? Sure. Uh, right in the southwest corner of West University Place is a YMCA. They are currently going to move. They're going to move somewhere else. But it's the three acres of land that uh, we need, we could use for parks. We have a, a lack of parks. So I set up a special, we call it a special task force mm -hmm. to study should we buy it. If so, how would we finance it? If we bought it, what would we do with it? And that, it was a really a crackerjack bunch of people. And they went out and um, met, met. You know, you've got to get a good guy, chairman of that thing. We did. And he met, and uh, they met for about two or three months and decided that, yes, we, it's the only thing to do. And, uh, you know, all, answered all our questions. 
had a little bound report, very nice little bound report, and we will probably, in, as, it, as time goes on, do that. A second one was when we were, our infrastructure needs replacing, we've had a special task force on our bond election. And that, once again, was a kind of a blue ribbon committee, and they met and um, decided how much bonds we needed and what we needed to do with them, and so we, yes, we can point. And I'm very much in favor. Better than hiring a consultant. You see, if you hire yeah. a consultant, you got to pay. It. That's right. But we've got people in West U who are consultants. Say, well, why not in our city? Well, thank you very much. I, it's been good <laughs> to have this practical application of some of the theoretical things we talked about last time, and we'll get back to the theory next time. But thank you very much. You're very welcome. Enjoy.